We're on the Golden Rule and we're talking to a bunch of environmentalists that are out here sailing with us. And uh, this is Dave E. And uh, tell us about yourself and your organization. Sure. Hi, I'm JV. I am the Frontline Communications Manager with Ironbound Community Corporation Environmental Justice Team. Uh, the Ironbound Community Corporation started over 55 years ago actually as a daycare. Um, the Ironbound is a low wealth black and brown community, predominantly folks who are foreign born immigrant population. Um, and about 30 plus years ago, the work of environmental justice actually started by the same parents and caregivers that had their kids in daycare uh, because there were a series of explosions in the facilities that were cited in our neighborhood, as well as the proposal of a garbage incinerator and also the discovery of one of the longest Superfund sites in the country, um, the result of Agent Orange manufacturing in our city and in our neighborhood uh, that resulted in dioxin contamination in 17 miles of the Passaic River. So was this uh, Agent Orange production, was that for Vietnam? It was. Uh, the Agent Orange was being manufactured for the Vietnam War. Uh, and folks who were working in the facility would walk back home with white powder on their shoes. Um, there's a local community pool that's not too far from the facility itself. And in 1983, when there were, were reports of people becoming sick, um, the Environmental Protection Agency came to the Ironbound to not just investigate the site, but try to vacuum up the dioxin, which looked like s snow. Um, and it's when the Diamond Alkali Company, that manufacturer of Agent Orange, was cited as a Superfund site. Is that dioxin still there? Yes, so now 40 years later, we're actually still in an effort to be able to clean up the dioxin. We understand that not only dioxin, but mercury, that's another byproduct of Agent Orange, is a contributor to elevated risk and cases of cancer and respiratory issues, among other public health impacts. Um, we have a lot of effort and a lot of work going into cleaning up the river. We've been told that in what we hope is going to be six to eight years from now, we'll have uh, a, a completed cleanup effort um, in our river. So we're looking forward to being reconnected to the river and reactivating uh, our park space that the community actually really fought for as well. This whole Ironbound Community Corp organizing, a pretty amazing project. Start, actually started out uh, with, an, uh, with a daycare effort. Want to say more about that? Sure. So it started as a way for our low-income immigration community to find a more affordable, easy-to-access uh, daycares. And more than 30 years ago, when we got our first proposal for a garbage incinerator, the community also organized and fought back against that incinerator. Unfortunately, it's still uh, in use today. It's the largest garbage incinerator in the whole state. And we also have the highest rate of asthma in the whole state as well. Um, besides the garbage incinerator and the Superfund site, we have uh, four fossil fuel power plants in our neighborhood. That's only four square miles with the proposal of a fourth power plant. And where we're sailing right next to you now is the port that we share with Elizabeth, uh, one of the largest ports on the East Coast, which means that all these containers and most of probably what we're wearing on deck today came through the ports and streets of Newark, um, which also result in diesel emissions coming from thousands of trucks who idle and have to move through residential streets in front of schools and homes. What we're looking at is one of the largest uh, scrap metal recycling yards on the entire East Coast, as well as uncovered salt piles. So that's actually where a lot of our area gets salt to uh, salt roads um, when it snows. Um, also, on this tour, we'll be able to see just some of the smokestacks that come from one of the three existing fossil fuel uh, power plants. Um, we may also be able to see the Covanta garbage incinerator as well. Wow. Well, you're dealing with a lot of struggles. What are the, um, what are the 
kind of primary concerns uh, you have right now and uh, what are some of the victories that you've had? So just last year, New Jersey passed one of the strongest environmental justice laws in the whole country. It's called the Environmental Justice Law. And it says that the Department of Environmental Protection now has the power to deny permits to facilities that would cause further harm and pollution to communities that have been historically targeted by industries. So for example, the Ironbound qualifies as an overburdened community that should be protected by this law because we are a low wealth community, um, because we are linguistically isolated, meaning that a lot of folks are actually Spanish and Portuguese speakers primarily, um, and because we are a, a minority group that is a lot of black and brown community members. So that's something that we have been fighting for for more than 12 years. And just this April, it's been officially put to use and so that means that we're able to fight back against new facilities that are proposing to come to the neighborhood. And just last year, we were able to stop a sludge facility that wanted to come into our neighborhood. Um, so those are all huge victories, a, a small community, but really showing how people power can win against large corporations and large projects. Um, but we do want to think of the environmental justice law as just the start of the future of environmental justice for not just our community, but communities throughout the state and the country. Wow, that's wonderful to have some victories, to have some momentum, to be able to show a great example about how, how that successful organizing can take place. So what are the primary challenges that you're dealing with today? Yeah. Thank you. Currently, we are still um, what is going on more than a year closer to two year battle with a proposal for a fourth fossil fuel power plant in our neighborhood. Um, it's been proposed by the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission. We've gotten a lot of momentum as well. We've had so many hundreds of community members, allies, folks who are even living outside of Newark and are concerned about different social justice issues, if it's immigration issues, Black Lives Matter, environmentalists, of course, um, who are all looking at this happening in real time that there may be the approval of a brand new fossil fuel project, um, even in the aftermath of what is finally passing this very strong environmental justice law. So that's one thing that we're dealing with now we've gotten support from our mayor to sign off on a resolution uh, against this fossil fuel project proposal we've gotten the county environmental commissioners to sign off against it um, several elected officials like uh, senator teresa ruiz to sign off against this uh, fossil fuel power plant and a lot of momentum online and through allyship throughout the state but also throughout the country um, so with all of this pressure to say no against this facility, we still are waiting to see if it will ultimately come to our neighborhood or not. Is there really a need for that much more power? Uh, does the community itself need that power or is that energy uh, being uh, going somewhere else altogether? We consider our community an environmental justice community and also we refer to our communities and communities that look like ours, uh, sacrifice zones. Being the home of the largest garbage incinerator in New Jersey means that over 50% of our garbage is trucked in by the tons from New York. It means that the garbage incinerator burns over 27 other municipalities outside of Newark and their garbage. And so the contamination is for our families and our community. The fossil fuel power plants power a lot of the state's energy but we are the only folks who are experiencing uh, the air pollution and the health impacts from it. And we also have sewage processing. So it's when we turn on our lights, flush our toilets, or throw out our garbage that our community is at the, the end, right? It's being sacrificed. I want to hear a little bit more about these health effects. How does uh, dioxin affect asthma? No. Uh, so dioxin is something that can be part of our air contamination. It's been definitely something that has contaminated our body of water, the Passaic River, for over 17 miles, as well as the soil. Um, but dioxin is also actually coming from the smokestacks in our community, those uh, three power plants, which now I remember um, the, the reason for that proposal for the fourth power plant is actually to prevent sewage overflow, which we experienced during Superstorm Sandy. 
but thankfully in those more than 11 years now we've come up with solutions that have prevented that from ever happening again during strong storms like Ida or Henri and so we don't actually see the need for this fourth uh, fossil fuel power plant as backup. Um, but in terms of the dioxin, the smokestacks are also contributors of dioxin, lead, and mercury actually as part of their air emissions. And it contributes to that incredibly high rate of asthma. In Newark, we have one out of every four people diagnosed with asthma. In New Jersey, we have an average of one out of every 12. So you referred to, to the community as a sacrifice zone or a sacrifice community. And uh, it seems like all over the country, oftentimes the most polluting uh, plants and industries and ex 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 uh, incinerators, etc., end up in poor communities of color. Do you think that's a coincidence? Definitely not. Over 80% of incinerators are located in low-income communities of color. And it is um, not just well, it is definitely the public health impacts, but it's the lived experience of frontline communities. For example, you may be able to see a plane flying overhead our community about every minute and a half to three minutes. And it's the smell from contamination. It is the noise pollution of all of the trucks passing through the neighborhood, having your conversation interrupted by an airplane flying overhead. and the headaches or nausea that can come from smelling very strong odors throughout your day. It means shutting your windows. It means not going out for recess during your school day. Um, and it's a lot of experiences that our community has had to face because of policies that have put these kinds of toxic industries uh, right in our backyard. Right, so clearly you don't want to have such a concentration of toxic creating industries right in your community. But aside from that, are you also promoting uh, alternative, like alternative energy, um, um, sustainable clean energy? Yes. Yes, one example that we have in our community is we also have a community farm, Down Bottom Farm, where we use it as a space to be able to connect with young people, talk about the community, but also connect with gardening, with the earth with the community, celebrate what we do love about our community, which is why we protect it so much. Um, but we do talk about alternatives. So an alternative to incineration would be actually moving our organic waste into composting, would move a lot of that waste. We think about complementary policies to the environmental justice law. For example, um, getting plastic pollution out of the garbage into the garbage incinerator. Uh, we also think about stronger standards um, against these facilities that have for a long time been able to have hundreds of air permit violations and still renew their permits um, every couple of years. Wow. Well, that's uh, very empowering. So I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about uh, you could have all this polluting activity happening and without any pushback, without any organizing, it would be very dis despair creating and disempowering. But what you're doing is empowering the community. Uh, do you see the impact of that? I do. I know that it's not just our team now, which is an amazing team, but it's been the work of over 30 years of community members being so organized against these facilities. Um, when the first incinerators were being proposed in New Jersey, it was proposed to be in every county of New Jersey. Unfortunately, Newark and Camden, some of the poorest, most uh, people of color population communities, have incinerators, but at least the other folks don't. We were able to fight off that sludge facility last year. We were able to stop even an Amazon air hub to uh, come to Newark that wanted to come to Newark and stop it from contributing to more pollution. Um, so we may be a small community, but we're very well organized, very connected, informed, and uh, we've been able to actually accomplish a lot. And the environmental justice law is something that we're really proud to have participated in. Uh, our director is actually, uh, was appointed in 2019 by President Biden to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And so we are looking forward to policy that is informed by the experience of frontline communities throughout the state and the country. It's 50 years later, and there's still dioxin in the river. So what are the prospects of getting rid of that dioxin? 
So there has been ongoing work uh, to be able to clear the river of dioxin since it's been designated a Superfund site. Uh, it's been a process that has taken very long because there's a lot of research into figuring out how to take dioxin that actually doesn't mix with water and ends up flooding when we do have climate disasters into our communities and homes. And so it's been over 40 years, but we're looking forward to in the next eight years to see it much cleaner as it's been promised and in the next few decades uh, something that we'd be able to feel safe uh, swimming in and enjoying again. You were talking about the shellfish. The, the shellfish take up dioxin? Yes, that's one of the advisories um, that come with the contamination of the Passaic River. It's to not consume the crabs or the fish that are in the river um, and like I mentioned we're a community of a lot of folks who are of different countries backgrounds and cultures and so there is a lot of fishing that happens um, so there is work to do in making sure that folks are not consuming uh, the fish that come from the river um, a lot of folks do continue to fish for sport but it's really just um, the sharing of that information, knowing that it is this history of contamination in the river, um, aside from all of the other facilities that have contributed to a lot of our health issues in the community. I just wanted to say that we're so proud and so happy to have Veterans for Peace and the Golden Rule Boat uh, choose the Ironbound of Newark as one of your docks. Uh, we have definitely experienced what it is to be impacted by that production of Agent Orange in our community. Um, our community, as you can imagine, is low income and so we're often, our young people are often drafted as well. And so this connection of knowing that we're looking forward to a future um, that is moving away from military waste and considering this legacy of harm caused to our communities is something that we feel really special to have been invited to. Okay, thank you. That is amazing and wonderful. Uh, well, we're so proud and happy to have you on board today, uh, on board the Golden Rule, of, uh, which is a boat that's being sailed by Veterans for Peace. And the, the Golden Rule is sailing for a nuclear-free world and a peaceful, sustainable future. Um, we see the climate crisis and nuclear, the threat of nuclear war as the two existential crises that are facing uh, the world today. And so I think it's really important for us and Veterans for Peace to make those connections and to bring that organizing to as mutually supportive as possible. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for joining us today and for, uh, for speaking to us. I'm Captain Hugh Carolla. I am the program director at Hackensack Riverkeeper. Uh, Hackensack Riverkeeper founded by Captain Bill Sheehan in 1997. And I showed up two years later and said, got any work? And he said, absolutely. So I've uh, been working with Hackensack Riverkeeper ever since. And uh, I'm one of the folks that drives one of our pontoon boats, do a lot of environmental education, uh, environmental advocacy, and action, active conservation. It's the work that we do. We are one of the uh, about 300 plus waterkeeper movements all around the world. It's a job that's a true, true labor of love. They appoint different people for different areas. Tell me what's going on in your area. Well, in the past, um, the big issue we had on the Hackensack River was overdevelopment and the threats to wetlands, a place known as the Meadowlands. And, uh, 2004, we won the main battle to stop any further development of those wetlands. So those now protected. So there's 8,400 acres of protected wetlands now in the New Jersey Meadowlands. And um, it also, of course, remains the legacy of pollution in the sediments of the river. And uh, just last year, our Hackensack River was declared a Superfund site like her sister river, the Passaic. So the entire lower half of the Hackensack River is a Superfund site and the process is moving forward to uh, create a cleanup plan for that. Um, another big issue we have is the lack of public access. In the past, because of pollution, overdevelopment, etc., cetera, um, the rights of people to access the river were taken away. And so we're working as hard as we can to help fix that problem. Uh, we've been able to direct monies for the building of fishing docks, uh, boat launches. We're working with uh, redeveloping companies that are doing um, some uh, 
recreational work and residential building um, on former industrial sites that will include public access, either direct water access in the form of like boat launches or kayak uh, ramps, or simply just to be able to walk along the waterfront and put a line in the water. Um, still not safe to eat the fish from this river yet, but we're getting there. We absolutely are getting there. And every year we get a little bit closer to the goal of a truly fishable, swimmable, and livable river. And that's something that will always be the goal of our organization and water keepers around the world. So something we can't not do. Where is the Agent Orange? It's around the corner here? Well, yeah, so we're, we're in, right now we're in Newark Bay, the, the northern reach of Newark Bay. And in front of us, uh, you'll see the Hackensack River goes to the right and the Passaic to the left. And ahead of us is Kearney Point. So if we were to go up the Passaic River, um, past the Covant incinerator, the largest in the country, uh, soon after that, you reach the former site of the Diamond Shamrock Company. Um, we unfortunately can't see that from here. We can't get there because of bridge construction on the Passaic River. Okay. Um, but it is an area that uh, is one of the oldest Superfund sites in America that's still being held up because of you know, corporate greed and the fact that um, the lawyers don't want to let the current crop of uh, corporate leadership to take the fall. <laughs> They're really willing to kick the can down the road for some other group of executives, you know. Um, and every minute, every hour, every day that justice is not served for the people of the cities of Newark, people of Kearney, the people of the whole region, uh, and particularly the people who live close to the people in the Iron Bound, the South Ward of Newark, um, that justice is, is denied. And so organizations like ours, you know, working with community groups in the Ironbound, they, they tell us what they need. Whatever they need from us, we're happy to, happy to step up and make happen. No. Okay, so this area is a super fun site because of the Agent Orange, I understand, right? But the uh, Hackensack River, why is that a super fun? Good question. So... Like I say, on the, 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 the entire Lower Passaic River, as you correctly explained, is a Superfund site and due mainly to the presence of dioxin, which was a byproduct of Agent Orange production at Diamond Shamrock. Um, but there were other things as well, all sorts of chemicals. There's that, all kinds of and everything in here too. Oh yes, oh, there's like, there's an alphabet soup <laughs> of contamination in the sediments of the Lower Passaic and the Lower Hackensack. Um, I've looked at the report, and it's a couple of pages of just, you know, to you and me, gobbledygook. Just polychlorinated biphenyls and methyl this and, oh my goodness. You know, uh, yes, chemicals, it was better living through chemistry back in the day, you know. And uh, clearly, um, much of the chemical waste still remains in the sediments of our rivers. The Hackensack, Passaic and also the waters all around New York City as well. Newark Bay, where we are right now. This used to be a phenomenal, phenomenal flounder fishery. The Bayonne Flats, you couldn't touch them for winter flounder. Now, the fish are here, but they are not, not safe to eat. And, you know, one day, yeah, they're going to be. I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see that happen, but I'm not going to stop fighting for that day. So that's what we do, you know. Um, so the dioxin comes from uh, militarism, right? Most of it. Yes, a good good portion. Absolutely, the the main chemical for which from or from which dioxin was a byproduct, absolutely was Agent Orange. And dioxin is present in the chemical itself, in the, the product itself, but also in its waste product. Um, so there actually there are multiple kinds of dioxin, different. I mean, again, I'm not a chemist. I, don't even, I can't even fake chemistry. I can fake biology, but not chemistry. Um, but what I'm ex what's been explained to me, there are different kinds of dioxins that are present in the sediments. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, without without the the need or the perceived need to defoliate the rainforests and jungles of Southeast Asia, there probably wouldn't have been an Asian orange created. But there was, because of you know the militarism and the need to deny the Viet Cong. And the North Vietnamese, uh, the cover of the forest. Yes. I wonder uh, the harms 
that the American public is suffering from this dioxin, how it compares to Southeast Asia? Well, obviously the, the main people, the most, the direct effects of Agent Orange are felt by the veterans, certainly, who were in country. Um, and the people in Vietnam, obviously, uh, on whose country it was dumped, um, I've read several articles and reports about the levels of cancers and certain kinds of uh, health issues that were not typical in that part of the world until after the war. Um, right. And, but obviously for us here, it's the loss of the fisheries, the inability for people to access their public trust rights to access the fish and to be able to swim and recreate in the water as, you know, my father did when he was a kid. You know, my father swam in the Pacific River, as did many, many other people, you know, way back in those days, you know. And so that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the issue that we, uh, we deal with, you know, from the community standpoints, you know, that the people in Newark and in Kearney and East Newark and Harrison, they just don't have the freedom to enjoy the waterfront as they should be able to if uh, the pollution was not there. And that's an issue that, you know, that advocacy groups like the Ironbound Community Corp is leading the charge on and have been for a long time because, as I say, they, they live it. You know, it's, it's, in their, it's in their front yard, their backyard, it's in their community. And groups like Hackensack, Riverkeeper and others, we uh, will take our lead from them and do what we can to step up as we can to help them in their fight, without a doubt, without a doubt. Anything else that you're working on you want to tell us about? Well, uh, in, in all the big sexy battles have been, <laughs> have been won. You know, we, we saved the Meadowlands. Uh, we stopped the loss of woodlands in the upper Hackensack River watershed where the reservoirs provide the drinking water for about a million people every day. So those big battles are, are won. Over 13 or 14,000 acres have been protected and remain protected. Um, public access has become um, and the public trust doctrine has become a part of New Jersey law um, that's happening we have an environmental justice law that finally got its enabling legislation passed through our legislature so that's moving forward um, the biggest thing right now is to um, get these waters cleaner now one of the quickest things that can be done is to stop the flow of pathogens into the river um, from sewage Things like fecal coliform bacteria, enterococcus bacteria, gets into our waterways from combined sewer overflows. And the best way to stop combined sewer overflows is to replace combined sewers with modern separate sewer systems for cities like Bayonne, like Jersey City, like Newark, like New York City. Um, it can be done. The money is there in the infrastructure bill. Okay, there is federal monies available for cities to step up and clean their waterways by making less sewage get into them. It can be done. It's being done. It needs to be done more. And our organization is a, a resource for those communities to help the leadership, you know, get the political oomph that they need, you know, uh, to make it happen. If people want to be able to recreate on the water, those waterways got to not be toxic. Okay, You're not going to get sick from the mud. You're going to get sick from the bacteria in the water if you swim in that water. All right? That's what we can do now in the short term. And so we make ourselves available and we speak of it at every minute we can. Uh, my boss is always, uh, it's not too, in his, wherever, whatever he's talking about, wherever he's talking, the, uh, the, the idea of fixing combined sewers is never far away. It's a very important thing we got to get going on. So that's uh, not a sexy thing, it's, but, uh, but it's an important thing without a doubt. So we're working on that as always. A lot of it's done kind of uh, in the background with our attorneys, you know, um, but um, it's an ongoing struggle that uh, will, be, will be met, will be met regardless. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. And thank you to the Veterans for Peace for, for coming here to our, uh, our wonderful harbor of New York and New Jersey. Really appreciate it. Uh, the work you do, the work you've been doing is a true inspiration for all of us who, who work for justice, who work for the environment, uh, because 
Together, that's how we win, and together, that's how justice happens. Thank you again, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're talking with Paula now. And uh, Paula, tell us about your what the work that you're doing. Well, I taught a public school in New York City for 44 years, and I was an activist back then. But now, since 2018, in June, I've been working practically full-time on, on peace and environmental justice. Um, we have a peace vigil in Teaneck, New Jersey, at the National Guard Armory that's been every single Wednesday uh, since 2005, every single Wednesday, um, you know, calling for peace in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, um, and we, we are now also fighting for justice, so we're trying to stop the ban on abortion and, and the ICE uh, prison. So we've kind of expanded from just uh, working on issues of peace. In the Don't Guess the Meadowlands Coalition, we worked for several years to stop, and we were successful stopping a power plant, a gas power plant in the Meadowlands in this region that we've been going through. Um, it was going to provide power for New York City, and, it, and New York City didn't even want that power. Anyway, we worked with a huge coalition, including Hackensack Riverkeeper and many, Food and Water Watch, many, many other um, environmental groups. And we um, had marches and town resolutions, and we worked incredibly hard. We had petitions. We got uh, legislators to sign on in opposition. And we stopped, we got Governor Murphy to stop that power plant. And we went right on after that to try to stop the New Jersey Transit power plant, gas power plant that would have been in Kearney, which is an environmental justice community. That's, so these, these yeah. power plants that you're talking about, these were gas power Gas plants? power plants, yeah. And so we, we um, work very hard again to try to stop the metal the transit power plant and Kearney. that was a tough one we got town resolutions we had marches we had petitions we had all kinds of demonstrations we spoke monthly at their uh, board meetings in opposition to the gas plant and we won we won we got governor murphy to have them pivot to a renewable energy alternative and then we did we kept our eyes on it and we realized that they didn't follow through, and we unwon, which I call it, we unwon, and and so now we're trying to force them again to stop the, the gas power plant and have a renewable alternative. That's an ongoing fight. It's a tough one. Then we we started. We were invited to work with the Ironbound Community Corporation to try to because there's so many fights in 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 Newark and especially in the Ironbound, you know, with with um, pollution, three power plants, uh, incinerator, the, the, the planes, the port, the trucks from the port, and so on. And so they, we were asked to help uh, to work together to stop the P Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission uh, power plant in the, in the Ironbound. And that's been a tough fight also, and we've had petitions and billboards and and meetings and rallies and demonstrations of all sorts and we attend monthly board meetings and speak out and we have not won that yet um, we're trying to get them also to have a renewable energy solution because that's the future we need to to transition to the to renewable energy we can't battery storage solar we can't continue with with pollution and, and the communities we're talking about with these power plants, and there, there's several other projects in New Jersey we're trying to stop. These are environmental justice communities that constantly have, um, you know, if you're going to put a power plant, put an environmental justice community. That's the history of it. And it's wrong, and it's got to stop. That kind of, that kind of racism just has to stop. And so it's, it's a tough battle, but we're working together, and that's the key to... to winning these battles, working together. Uh, as far as uh, renewable energy, you know, what's going on? How, how do you think we're doing here in this area? Well, it's, it's tough. We have a governor who said that he 
supports renewable energy. We have we he's and he's actually pushed for wind um, wind farms and so on. But this is a tough fight because a lot of the politicians are probably funded, most likely funded by the fossil fuel industry. And so we have a tough fight because often, like our governor, Governor Murphy, they talk good. They talk good. They support environmental justice. They support renewable energy. Um, but then when you get down to the, on the ground, they, they, will not, they are not taking, our governor has not taken a stand opposing these seven uh, fossil fuel projects. And it's, it's just really tough because you have the fossil fuel industry and the banks who are funding this and supporting it and, and, and the lobbyists and, and we have people power. And the, the more we unite, the more we work together, the more, the better we, the more we will win. You know, we have even at, at our peace vigil, you know, the issue of fossil fuel wars, like the wars that are going on right now, the war in Iraq, another oil war. We have a big fight. It's such a big fight. But there are forces in this society, in this country, and all around the world that are fighting the same fight. And it's really important that we work together. The environment, the fight of the environmental movement is the same fight that we have with the peace move, you know, on the issue of peace. It's about fossil fuels, it's about transitioning to renewable energy and, and things that support life instead of harm people and kill people your anti-war organization, how do they feel about the war in Ukraine? Okay, we, we would like, to, we want to, diplomacy. We want diplomacy. We want Russia out of Ukraine and we want diplomacy. It's like absolutely crucial, you know, and, and yeah, we want the war dollars home, we want the war dollars to come home. Do you feel that uh, uh, part of American imperialism? Yeah, I mean, look at, look what we saw in, in Iraq. When, when they concocted a story about weapons of mass destruction, when Bush and company concocted that story, and they used, they used the World Trade Center bombing, which was a horror, but they used it to get us in, you know, like we've got to have a war. We've got to have, we've got to go to war with Iraq. We've got to. And look at the destruction of hundreds of thousands of lives, with civilians. Probably a million. A million. And then you have the displacement of multi millions of people internal displacement, external displacement. It's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Afghanistan, the same thing. A war, it's a war, another war based on lies. And so many people's lives destroyed. It's, it's, it's just a horror and we have to stop it. And you know, like we have our peace vigil, like there are groups around this, the country that have our peace, we have our peace vigils our anti-war vigils. And we stand there on street corners and sometimes we have a big crowd, sometimes we have a smaller crowd. But we do it because we know that on, as people drive by, as people honk, as people wave, as people give a thumbs up and, and peace signs, they're having conversations in their cars. And sometimes they bring those conversations from the cars or trucks to their homes and talk about it. And we want people to, to raise these issues because they're not in the news so much. And so we have to keep this on people's minds. It's really, really critically important. So, um, you know, I was originally in the, uh, I was in the original Gulf War demonstrations. And, uh, you know, that, that was a time that we turned out a million people. And, uh, you know, but we weren't able to stop the war and they had it anyway. But, uh, you know, it seems like there is no peace uh, faction anymore in the Democratic Party. 
So I sort of wonder what we're going to do. The only thing that we can really do is shut them down. What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, and we just have to keep advocating. We have to keep advocating for peace, and we have to keep advocating for, for diplomacy and bringing the war dollars home. And, and we have to work around with people around the country, around the world, and just keep on, keep on pressing and get people elected to office who will advocate for peace and for negotiations and for bringing the war dollars home. How do you feel about the current delegation from New York? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm New Jersey, but you know, I just we need better. We need we need people who are going to really advocate for peace. Yeah. Um, I'm a military mom, and. You know, one of the things that I'm that I've learned in being involved in anti-war work and environmental work is that we have some issues, many issues in common. And this, for example, we're going. We we went very near the plant where they produce dioxin for Agent Orange today. We went near where that plant used to be. That plant caused the death of many workers from cancers, the death of residents in the iron bound of Newark. It's hurt this river because they threw the, the leftover dioxins into the Passaic River. And I live with somebody who was in the Vietnam War who now has Agent Orange, all these years later, has Agent Orange poisoning. And I think about the people in Vietnam who've dealt for all these many decades with Agent Orange poisoning, which has passed on through the generations and harmed people and killed people. And it, it, it breaks my heart because we need to stop poisoning other people, using weapons, chemical weapons, using nuclear weapons. We have to stop. And we have to stop harming people. For example, in East Palestine, Ohio, where the, the train derails and the, the, the um, vinyl chloride burns and becomes a dioxin. And the people now are learning that they too are being harmed by the same dioxin that is killing workers, killing people in the iron bound, in Vietnam, in, among our soldiers and, and Marines. You know, this, this factory that made this dioxin, Agent Orange, uh, was that a subsidiary of Monsanto? I don't think so. It was Diamond Alkalide. And, you know, a lot of, it got bought up by other com companies, and I'm, I'm not sure which company owns, owns, I mean, it kept, kept cha that's changed over the years. Um, some companies don't want to take any responsibility for what happened. Well, have they had to uh, pay for this? There has been some of that, some payments. There are some legal actions. I think you need to speak to someone else who's like more knowledgeable about the details of that. But it's been a long and ugly history. And it's, it's not over because the dioxin's still on the ground and it's still in the water. It's still in the mud along the banks of the, the river. Does that uh, ever dissipate? Right, right. No. It just lasts forever. It lasts, it lasts and lasts. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing, for example, Vietnam veterans who are just now getting symptoms from Agent Orange poisoning just now. Like my friend fought and was there in 
1962, 63, and is just now getting symptoms of Agent Orange poisoning. Now, fortunately, Veterans for Peace and other people have fought really hard to get legislation, the PACT Act, the recent PACT Act that was passed, that um, supports veterans of the Iraq War uh, who, and Afghan War who were affected by burn pits. And it also is supporting um, Vietnam veterans who've been exposed to Agent Orange. Finally, they're getting some relief and some disability payments. But it's, it's you know, I'm t just on another subject. I'm so happy to be associated with Veterans for Peace and, uh, you know, people like Susan Schnall and others who have fought for decades to get compensation for veterans and to get areas in Vietnam cleaned up, areas where there was Agent Orange sprayed, you know, so I'm, I'm thankful to be happy to be working with Veterans for Peace all these years. Okay, well, anything else you want to add? I want to tell young people about something my kindergarten students did starting in 2013, 2014, when we were studying about t foods in our school cafeteria and we were learning about tomatoes. They wanted to know about tomatoes and how they're grown and, and, and so on. And so as we were doing the research about tomatoes, we learned about pesticides and how some uh, farmers and gardeners use pesticides to keep away aphids and so on. And the more we, and then we continued learning about pesticides and it was kind of upsetting to the kids and to me. And I never like to leave children angry and upset. It's wrong. And so we made a plan what we could do about it. We made a whole list. We could make signs. We could tell our parents. We could, we could do all sorts of things on this list. We started interviewing some grandparents who'd been involved in fighting pesticides in Long Island. And they told us what they did, including talking to lawmakers, um, writing letters, um, make, um, having meetings and, and marching. And we got up in class and started marching. Well, anyway, we, we wrote a play about it. Then uh, we had, there was a, a city council member who was in our school for something else. We invited him to our classroom and the, he, the, he was so excited about what the kids were saying. He said, come to City Hall. When we went to City Hall a, a couple months later, he said, what can I do for you? What can I do about this pesticide problem? He, and they had written a play about it and they started chanting, ban toxic pesticides, use only nature's pesticides, pass a law. And he looked at them very seriously and he said, I promise I'll try. In 2015, Councilman Ben Kalos introduced into the City Council of New York a bill to ban toxic pesticides in New York City parks, playgrounds, and public spaces. Well, over the years, the kids, um, we went to City Hall by subway, 60 of us going to City Hall with 60 parents, grandparents, babysitters, and so on, and accompanied by many environmental activists. And it took six years, but on Earth Day in 2021, the law was passed unanimously by the city, New York City Council to ban pesticides in New York City parks, playgrounds, and public spaces. And now we're working as a coalition to, um, to get in park workers to learn about organic land management. And that's going on right now. We have at least five demonstration projects in, in uh, city parks to, to uh, work on uh, techniques for uh, organic land management. So my message to teachers all over the country, all over the world, and to children all over the world is, you can make a change working, with, working together, working with other people, children working with adults. We can make changes, big, big changes in this world. And never give up, never, ever give up. Hey, thank you.
Now we're talking with Terry, and uh, you're with Veterans for Peace, and you're a, a teacher, high school teacher? Correct, yeah. So uh, let's talk about what's going on in the schools right now, because they're trying to censor everything, and uh, you know, their word for it is wokeism. They don't want you to be awake, right? Yeah. So uh, are you being affected by this? Uh, thankfully, not uh, not now, not yet. Um, I feel supported um, by uh, my building and by my uh, by my union that um, we are going to teach truth, and we're not going to be intimidated to uh, you know to whitewash once again uh, history, right? Because um, to to teach history, you you have to teach Black history, you have to teach Latino history, you have to teach women's history. Uh, sexual minorities history that um, has been for so long left out of of our curriculum. Um, so, in fact, my kids this whole week we've been doing uh, since they already took the AP history test. We've been doing a lot of current events, and um, uh, I'm sure Governor DeSantis of Florida, thankfully not our governor, would uh, accuse us of being a little too woke in our classroom. But uh, the the kids uh, they know they experience firsthand. Um, the injustices of, uh, you know, structural racist housing, uh, school funding that is uh, unequal, and um, you know, more to the point of, uh, of you know, what the boat is highlighting here today, um, you know, that every dollar that is spent on weapons and the military is dollars that are not spent on uh, education, healthcare, housing, and um, you know, and and that the U.S. military. Uh, is the um, by itself is a larger emitter of carbon than many many nations and for every ton of carbon that is emitted uh, that comes back to hit us now climate change is now I mean the climate change has, has, has hurt you know the global south for for generations now but it is it's visiting upon our shores uh, here in the United States disproportionately people of color sadly um, two September's ago Hurricane Ida when it um, came aboard New Jersey and there was record flooding the Passaic River flooded and uh, two just graduated um, uh, seniors or they just graduated were swept away in the floods uh, from Hurricane Ida and um, so the the students I work with they have a very uh, acute understanding of um, not only climate change but you know human security or rather lack of human security and when 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 we define uh, national security you know typically in the mainstream media it's about you know weapons and about the next threat uh, you know and you know China or some other you know threat out there um, but we need to define national security as human security uh, how are safe are our schools um, how funded are our schools uh, how resilient and ready are we for the effects of climate change and um, I was in the Navy from 2004 to 2008, and um, uh, thankfully I was not in Iraq or Afghanistan, but it was really the Iraq war that made me start to peel back the onion and see some of the, the lies that our foreign policy and the brute power that it's built upon. And so now I'm an active member of Veterans for Peace Chapter 21 in North New Jersey, and instead of doing um, war games and you know simulated uh, mock invasions of of uh, adversaries uh, as we did and I think those war games do provoke our quote-unquote enemies um, here on the golden rule today to highlight the dangers of uh, nuclear weapons, the dangers of climate change, and the da dangers of militarism. Jerry, do you want to uh, Well, one of the things that got me woke was reading The People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. But, you know, that's a book that was uh, banned in many, many many school districts, uh, I'm, I'm glad there still are some woke people. Terry, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your background growing up and how, why you went, what your experience was in the Navy, what, what prompted you to join, and, and, uh, and how, I think you said a little bit about this already, but why and how you became a member of Veterans for Peace. Sure, I'm from the uh, suburbs of Philadelphia, Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, pretty rural suburbs. Um, and uh, I went to Catholic school my whole life, was at the, a Catholic prep school uh, north of Philly. 
and um, for whatever reason, you know, you've, I felt that vague call, uh, really hard to define and articulate, you know, why, you know, to quote unquote serve my country and that, you know, the, the honor um, of, of, you know, doing that and I was kind of like, a, like many young men are and, and women too, but a lot of times young men are attracted by the uniforms, by the, um, you know, the a lot of the trappings of the military and I think that's that kind of got me and I wanted to go to um, it stuck in my head by eighth grade that I wanted to go to Annapolis and um, uh, so I pursued that thankfully I decided to take an ROTC scholarship instead and went to the University of Notre Dame South Bend Indiana and um, so I didn't have to do you know the military lifestyles per se in college but then of course when I graduated um, uh, was out was out in the Navy, but I would say you know kind of as I mentioned the high school I teach at versus the high school I went to the high school I teach at um, you know every couple of weeks there is a military recruiter in the in the halls uh, sometimes you know in the counseling's office and I don't I don't blame students for 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 signing up you know I, I signed up um, and but but it, we are an over recruited district because we're in a lower lower income community. And compare that to the high school to where I went to, um, we did not have military recruiters there. We might have had, you know, West Point and uh, the Air Force Academy in Annapolis, you know, college admissions officers. Uh, but you can you can really sense the the um, the class differences there, and then also the, yeah the the economic draft. So um, so anyway, going back to my own transition, I thought I wanted to be a lifer. Um, thought I wanted to be in the Navy and maybe even go into Intel. I was actually studying Arabic um, when when 9/11 happened, and um, you know I was at the time I saw the, the the reasoning and I thought there was a case to be made for the war in Afghanistan. At least at the time I was kind of on board, um, and then of course um, Iraq and I was studying abroad in Cairo, Egypt at the time and digesting not U.S. corporate media and um, and just to was really a a time for me to see that, um, yeah, just the utter insanity behind that war. But and then you start to look at all the other wars, um, and then Afghanistan as well. Like, does that make sense that we're there? Um, um, and so, I, when I was out in the Navy, thankfully I was not deployed to any of those places, but doing. You know, for weeks at a time, doing uh, circles at sea on the USS Calpins, um, or being tied to the to the pier uh, in Ingleside, Texas, on the, on a mine hunter, and uh, I just had a lot of time and boredom. And actually, funny enough that you mentioned Howard Zinn, um, not when I, not when we were underway, because that would be very safe. But when I was in port, officer of the deck, and you're just kind of standing there answering phones, I would I got a ton a ton of reading done and much alternative reading, quote unquote, and. Um, to include Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, I had it under the deck log, uh, you know, so like I didn't want to get caught reading, certainly didn't want to get caught reading Zinn on watch. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's happening at the same time that I'm sitting there, you know, I feel like my brain's rotting, I'm just watching seagulls and, you know, and, and we're tied to the pier and uh, the amount of resources are being spent on this ship, the amount of resources being spent um, in Iraq, and um, almost submitted a conscientious objector application uh, in 2005. Had a lot of good supports who, who, who wrote letters for me. Um, in the end, I didn't submit it. Um, you know, I, I wasn't sure whether I was uh, a pacifist per se or an against all war. You know, maybe a, uh, against most wars and uh, currently, you know, the wars that we the way with the weapons that they're fought with now. I mean, how how can there be a just war? Um, so. I did not submit a CO application, but um, but it, but I knew when I get out of the the Navy, uh, I was going to get into education in some way or another. Um, still convinced that if people have the right information, uh, whether it be about you know quote unquote weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, and really do the digging to 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 realize that um, you know that we should have been able to see through those lies if we were had some historical literacy and that I would become a teacher in the fight against that ignorance. Um, and, and here I am now, and yeah, it's great to be here. So, you know, I see a great parallel between the lies that were told about getting us into a war in Iraq, which was 
totally unprovoked. And, you know, the current war in Ukraine, which was totally provoked, which the U.S. media and the whole propaganda apparatus does not want you to know anything about. And uh, they're very serious about it. And um, so uh, there's a big dichotomy now in the peace movement. And um, one of my friends, uh, Bruce Gagnon, compared it, he said that it was a war between the anti-imperialists and the liberal Democrats. And, um, and so what you were talking about, the Howard Zinn and uh, another good book would say could be uh, Killing Hope, you know, uh, where, you know, you learn about the whole history of the U.S. imperialism. And, and uh, you know, you, uh, that's quite a transition. It's almost like uh, becoming deprogrammed from a, a religion or something, you know. Um, have you ever thought about this? The, the, sorry, one more time, the, the last question coming. About uh, the difference between people who have gone through that tra transition of understanding about the history of U.S. imperialism and everybody else that has it. Yeah, you know, um, I, I guess, yeah, it is. I have thought about it, and, and I see where I was. Um, I see where I was, you know, as a student, still believing, you know, in kind of that we, um, you know, we sometimes err, but, you know, that the United States, you know, in the end uh, does the right thing or tries to do the right thing. And that was kind of my ethos, you know, in high school and even for most of college. Um, and really it was, it was Iraq that kind of broke that, and then I start to look at other things. Um, but I remember uh, even in junior year, you know, um, being relatively progressive on many issues, but still um, in the end, you know, writing an essay that we, you know, I felt at the time that we had to nevertheless uh, drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I had argued that that, that was the right call. Nowadays, I feel very, very differently uh, that that was not the right call. And I, I you know, famous generals uh, and admirals at the time, like William Leahy and Dwight D. Eisenhower and George Marshall, I believe, and other military leaders are, did, were against dropping the nukes, which is often left out of the narrative. But just the other day, I was doing a, a lesson with my kids on, um, you know, sh um, we were returning to the questions of World War II and should we have dropped the nuclear weapons. And uh, my kids are, you know, very... Uh, due to their backgrounds, very, very progressive on many issues, many left-leaning. But it's funny, uh, on that question of should we have dropped the bombs or not, still a majority said uh, yes. And I had to, you know, you know, I challenge them, but also recognize that's where I was. And a, a good teacher is going to, um, um, you know, share, I think, where he, uh, she, they are. But um, I'm not going to... I want to lead them to what I think is the truth without, you know, indoctrinating them. Um, so write a good essay and let's disagree. And I think through that discourse, you know, maybe, you know, five, ten years from now, or maybe not, maybe they'll come to a different understanding of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, but I did have that moment where it's like, yeah, no matter, all these other issues on uh, social and domestic issues, uh, my kids very much left, uh, left-leaning, progressive. But, um, you know, I don't know whether it's the militarism that's, you know, or just textbooks have done such a good job of indoctrinating kids for so long. You know, they, they gave the standard retort is, you know, well, it's something we had to do. Um, you know, we had to incinerate all those civilians because of, you know, the standard reasons given. Um, but, um, but I hope to sow seeds, you know, as a teacher that, you know, you're not going to make everyone feel exactly the same way you are, nor, nor should you, you know, let them... Let them come to the truth, uh, or let them come to their own understanding. And um, I'm a, just relatively a new parent, and uh, you know, hope to parent the same way too. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, we want to show them both, you know, you know, our values, but also, um, you know, let them let them come to it on their own as well. Well, what's an ironic thing is that uh, the golden rule, you know, was originally trying to stop the. Uh, uh, bomb tests in the Marshall Islands and uh, with my dad 
uh, was, I found out recently, actually on a submarine that was sent down to the Marshall Islands to drop off uh, Marines to go be guinea pigs, right? Because there was not only the Marshallese that were the uh, guinea pigs, it was, it was also soldiers, right? And uh, then they were uh, irradiated and uh, lots of them got sick. But um, uh, I could never convince my dad that they didn't need to drop the bomb, right? And there were lots of people you know, in the Roosevelt administration that didn't want to drop the bomb. But it, uh, from what I understand, it was the Truman administration that decided to do that. But there were lots of people that were against it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's kind of ironic that my dad did get irradiated. <laughs> you yeah. know. No, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it is, it, it, that, that um, notion, I think, still sticks with the I don't know if it's a majority of Americans, but even those, you know, kind of liberal progressive um, minds that, um, you know, it's something we had to do. And I think then that carries over then into our current posture is like, yeah, these things are dangerous, but we have to have 5,000 of them, uh, which, you know, is, um, you know, is there are examples where, you know, aside from them being used, right, uh, the almost uses, right, the almost uses in famous cases in 1983 or of course in the Cuban Missile Crisis when we've come so close to uh, all-out nuclear war and um, I mean I think the only sane way is um, for the international community to come together and that's you know what we're here on this boat to highlight that um, that we're actually these weapons make us entirely unsafe and uh, one of the things that I'm really learning on this trip is that uh, all the American people that are harmed by the chemical pollution from militarism. And this area is like one gigantic toxic waste dump. Yeah, yeah and, and it's people don't make that connection. My, my parents, for a while, they lived in Warminster, Pennsylvania. There was a, 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 a Navy base that has since closed um, but for years, the Navy was contaminating the water, and um, you know, people then just moved to, uh, you know, kind of bottling their water for a while. But there was not much of a connection, and maybe there were maybe just because people weren't on the ground organizing to like say like this. This is, you know, it didn't make anyone, uh, unfortunately, at that time, you know, anti-militarist, um, and. Um, but it, yeah, and, it, and that was a that was a suburban, mostly white community, you know, and and of course the 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 damage is uh, even more so in, um, you know, disproportionately communities of color, and of course what we do internationally, globally, um, you know, just the example you shared with the Marshall Islands, um, yeah, it, you would hope that it would translate into into activism to to fight that, but. Um, I guess in some cases it hasn't, in some cases it hasn't. It's great to have you on board, Jerry, and it's great to have you in Better for Peace, and thanks for all the good work you're doing. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Especially with the kids. It's fantastic. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you.